help here. I think we should talk about upper extremity nerve conduction studies. What do you think? You excited about it? Oh, okay. Come on, let's go take a look. Hey everybody, it's Andy. And this is the second set of lectures on basic EMG. And remember our goals are, of course, for you to have some real basic competency in EMG testing, which is a technical skill. And even more important for you to have an understanding of peripheral nerve disorders, right? So even if you end up not doing EMG as a physiatrist, it's very important that you get good at it because later in your career, you're gonna be using these thought processes to make much more precise diagnoses than many of your friends in other fields, including fields like neurology and orthopedics who often don't quite understand the nerves the way that we do. Um, so I'll start with the slideshow, which is uh, it's a nice slideshow. Here it is. And here we go. Week two, noises and arms. So I want to start out with noises. When you're doing a needle EMG, the sound on the machine is actually almost more useful than what you see on the screen. It's easy to show you something by looking at pictures and you can study them, but actually a really great electromographer is listening more than anything else. So as we go along, I'm going to talk about these things and I'll show you some pictures and videos and sounds. And, and you know, it's kind of funny on the computer, the, the frequency content isn't the same. And so an EMG doctor listening to this on a computer is going, yeah, that's not quite the same as I really, really feel sound here when I'm doing my tests. So there's two kinds of noises when you put that EMG needle in the muscle. And if you remember, if you're using one of my monopolar needles, you've got an electrode on the skin, which is your reference. And you've got your needle, which is the active. And you've got a ground, which is actually the common, common mode rejection electrode, which gets rid of all the background noise, right? So with the monopolar electrode, the, um, the surface uh, reference stays sort of close to where you're putting the needle in, okay? If I put the reference here and put the needle in my biceps, there's gonna be too much background noise between the two and there'll be some deformity of waveforms and stuff like that. So if you're doing the forearm, you ought to keep the reference on the forearm. And if you're going into the hand, maybe you move it to the hand. And if you're doing the upper arm, maybe you move it to the upper arm, the, the reference that is. And the needle goes in the muscle, right? There's two kinds of sounds that you want to get to know about. And you'll see them as well. There's spontaneous activity and motor units, right? So when you put the needle in the muscle, you listen and watch. And you jab around, little precise jabs, remember, you know, if you fill up more than a screen after you stop inserting, that's increased insertional activity. It's lasted too long, right? And then after that, you can have other things that continue after you dip, give a jab or even when you're not jabbing. That's all spontaneous activity. Then there's the motor units. When you ask somebody to tense up and each motor unit is what? One nerve cell and all the muscle cells, it's innervates, right? And we talked about polyphasic motor units, et cetera. So, um, Normal spontaneous activity, and we'll come to the videos in a minute, kind of as a recoup. Um, if you put a needle right near the motor end plate of a muscle where the, where the nerves plug in, you'll often hear a seashell sound. And you'll also hear another sound, which is like this, ouch! Because when your needle's right at the motor end plate, it kind of hurts. So you just get out of there, right? The other thing you can see at the end plate is some sputtering spikes, and you'll see these sputtering things. So when you see those things, don't confuse them with motor units and you don't confuse them with abnormal spontaneous activity uh, and they hurt. So get the needle the heck out of that area. The most important abnormal spontaneous activity are fibrillation potentials. And if you remember if the needle's touching it or close to it, you can get a positive wave, which is a little different shape and a little different sound. These mean the muscle membrane is unstable. And the most important reason for that is that there's a nerve not plugged into the muscle, okay? But it can also happen in myopathies. It can happen with local trauma. It can happen if there's blood on it, like there's a bruise on the, on the, on the outside of the muscle uh, and with some metabolic disorders as well, okay? Um, there's even a disease called EMG disease, which is basically a, 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 a very mild myopathy, which has no impact on people. 
and it finds positive ways in fibrillations all over the place and the persons live forever without any particular neurologic disorders. So if you think about a fibrillation as being a muscle membrane unstable, a fasciculation is the anterior horn cell in the spinal cord being unstable. And that's a whole modi unit shooting off its mouth randomly without any good control, okay? Now there are some uncommon things that they're not so uncommon that you won't see them. If you're doing an EMG a week, you'll see one a few times a year at least, many times, right? If you're doing you know, a whole day of EMG, you'll see them once a month or less. So complex repetitive discharges are also a sign of nerve damage, but they seem to correlate with chronic irritative nerve problems. And the science on that isn't so great, but that's kind of the story we have, right? I contrast this with myotonia, which comes below, because complex repetitive discharge start and stop suddenly. <laughs> right? And myotonic discharges wax and wane and they don't stop and start. And you'll hear these, but it, people will see CRDs and go, ooh, that's a myotonic dystrophy. That's weird, right? So you don't want to do that. Myotonia is most famous for myotonic dystrophy, but there are other diseases. I actually had somebody last month who appeared to just have some nerve irritation who had it. And that's uncommon, but it can happen. Um, so when you see these, you go, whoa, this is really weird. And this is when I used to call up my professor and put her, put the phone near the machine and say, is that what it is? And these things sound like a, a dive bomber in those World War II movies. They're pretty wild. Okay. And so when you see these, you think about myotonic dystrophy and there are other dose disorders. You differentiate this from anything else because the amplitudes kind of wax and wane and the frequency of the little spikes occur. So slow down and speed up, right? And so they'll say that was a waxing and waiting and amplitude and frequency. And that's a myotonic discharge. Myokinia is like some anterior horn cells or the nerves where they attach are kind of working together, but not quite right. And it's a complicated neuro neurophysiologic thing. But basically, let's say you have four motor units in this myokinia thing. They all kind of fire as a group together. Thrump, 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 thrump. But it's not like motor unit A and then B and then C and then D. Okay, you look at it and they all kind of have different shapes, right? And it's like, maybe once it's A, B, C, D, the next time around it's B, A, D, C, the next time it's around, you know, diff C, A, D, B. So you see these groups of modi and it's firing together like a, like a tremor, brum, 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 but they aren't in precise order locked to each other, okay? And myokinia is interesting. I, I think of it most when I think of radiation plexitis. When you see that, it makes you think less of metastatic cancer and more about radiation plexitis as a cause of arm pain, right? But it occurs with other nerve and muscle diseases, uh, nerve diseases, excuse me. Um, cramps, you won't see much, but if somebody's leg or arm truly cramps while you have a needle in it, A, they hurt a lot, pull the needle out and let them stretch. But there's a very, very high frequency discharge with, with those. Um, now we're going to talk about motor units. Okay. Actually, let's take a, let's, let's go back and I'm going to go, I hope I can do this and share my, some of the noises here. Let's see. What do I have here? Um, Google Chrome. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Okay. So take a look at this. This is end plate noise, and I'm hoping the sound comes up. I'm going to turn it way up just in case that helps us. And let me blow up the picture here. Take a listen. It's not the pop, pop, pop. It's the shh in the background. Pretty subtle. Okay? Pretty subtle. You're right here in end plate. Okay? So if you go back to the beginning of this, you don't hear that. You go out here. Another one. Um, these are end plate spikes and listen to them they, that, that look, there's a motor unit they look like, right? They, anything that goes up first is good. <laughs> it's not abnormal. If it goes down first, it's a positive wave or fibrillation and that's, that's, that's abnormal. So take a listen here. It's sputtering, you're not moving the needle. They're not trying to tense the muscle. These things are those are, those are end plate spikes. Nothing abnormal there. Just get away from the end plate because it hurts. 
this next one is uh, positive waves and fibrillations. And by the way, Bill Pease, who's at Ohio State, our, our rival at Michigan, uh, and Jun Kamura, uh, <clears throat> who's in Japan and at Iowa, um, uh, made a lot of these, uh, these pictures that are on the web that, that you'll be able to access when you get to my slides. So positive waves go down and then come up in a big bump. Fibrillations go down and up kind of sharply. So here we go. Pop, 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 like rain on the roof. That's a fib. There it goes. Now let's pause it as I'm sure it's up here. See that guy going plug, plug, plug in the background? So that sharp thing's a fib. The thing rumbling in the background, boom, 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 is a positive wave. You can see they both go down before they go up. So we catch one. So on the left hand side is a positive wave. The next one's a fibrillation. Neurophysiologically, they mean the, mean, mean the same thing. And if people remember, um, if these fibs get really small, like less than 50 microvolts, it's probably a lesion that's over a year old. So look at this, it says 50 microvolts per division. This fib is 50, 100, 150, 200. It's over 200 microvolts, so it's a more recent injury, okay? Okay, whoopsie. Stop, stop. Gotta go back, hold on, I'm gonna mess you up here. Uh, oh well, let's go on. Um, these are fasciculations. And if you look across the bottom of Dr. Kamira's screen here, you see this mode unit, you know, there's a very long time period firing kind of randomly all by itself. And now let's listen and watch. You, you put the needle in the muscle, you step away, you let go of the needle, tell the person to relax, and you hear this. It's a motor unit, but they're not making it happen. It's not, not firing based on people controlling. It's just a normal looking, or it's a motor unit, and it can be normal looking. If I look at this one, let's see. Catch it. Come on. There. If you look at that one, it's pretty polyphasic, isn't it? It's squiggle, 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 squiggle. And, and that means that this, this fasciculation is not only a MODI unit firing off by itself, but it's sprouted out to help other MODI units that are denervated. So that is a polyphasic MODI unit because it's helping out somebody else who's already denervated. Therefore, there's been denervation. And it's fasciculating because the uh, the the anterior horn cells are, are 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 irritated and not healthy. Okay, pop pop pop, and you can count how many in thirty seconds or something like that. Now the silly ones. Um, this is a complex repetitive discharge. Listen to it start and stop suddenly. That's not it. Stops. Okay. All right. Stops. He's trying to dig around and get some more of the Pokemon. So you're looking for it to start and stop suddenly. And then if you actually look at it, it's not the, the, the firing rate is pretty kind of consistent. And this guy is the same same height as this one. And this is, and they don't change in shape. Okay. So it's kind of easy to tell uh, uh, the complex repetitive discharges from the next thing I'll show you, which is a myotonic discharge because they're all kind of consistent and it stops and starts suddenly. So this is the thing you call up your professor and say, I heard it, because it's not real common. Take a listen. Waves are all different shapes and sizes and they fire slow and then they're gonna, here you go, this is gonna put the needle. Bigger and smaller all by themselves. That's just wacky, and that person probably has a hatchet face and distal atrophy and cramping fingers that don't hurt, and their whole family probably has it, and since they're so used to it, they probably don't think they have a disease. So myotonic dystrophy patients show up as 50-year-old adults, and all their brothers and sisters have it, and none of them ever knew they had it. You know, isn't it normal that when I grab the car door, my hand has trouble letting go, right? Um, these are myocomic discharges, and these are actually hard to appreciate, but I'll show it to you. Remember, there's, there's three or four or five motor units that fire, but not in the same order altogether, but they kind of work together going rank, rank, rank. So here we go. Chip, 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 chip. 
Heart, if you look at the bottom, oop, can I go back? I hope. Um, now I can't. Oh, well, if you look at the bottom, they were all kind of regular. Um, the next one I got is a cramp. And this is, you can't quite appreciate, but here we go. Firing like crazy. There, that really fat, that is the cramp facility or the cramp discharge. Those are just painful. Don't like those. All right. But they're not a sign of any other disease. Um, going back to our slideshow, which is over here. Here we go. So those are our, our, our uh, spontaneous activities, right? Let's go down to mode units. So a normal mode unit can turn down, up, down, up, back down, up to five turns, okay? Normal units, motor units, are bigger in the hands and feet than they are in, let's say, the butt, okay? Probably because there's fat between muscle cells proximally and all kinds of other reasons. Um, so, so you know, we talk about norms, and I just put a, a random number here down below that if it's more than 500 microvolts, that's really too big. That's really too big any place, 5,000, okay? If it's in the butt muscles, uh, boy, that's really huge. In the hand, you could almost wonder if it's not a real big deal, okay? Um, the width of the MODI units that are large uh, is usually wider than 10 milliseconds. Now, that's sometimes hard to appreciate unless you have a really good eye or you can just isolate that one MODI unit or you do something fancy on your EMG machine to make it catch the top of it and average 10 or 15 of them so you can see because sometimes there's a little bit at the beginning that's very small and then it gets the steep part and then it gets the long part. But if you really look carefully and get practice looking at normal MODI units, you'll see they're usually less than 10 milliseconds wide. Um, uh, polyphasics, as we said, are, are taller, they're wider, they have more squiggles. Sometimes you have this thing that looks like a normal MODI unit, but fixed in time, firing at exactly the same time as this one, Maybe you know a quarter of the screen down the road, there's another little guy going beep, beep. So you got thwop and beep occurring at exactly the same time over and over and over again. So it's not always like it's squiggly all the way up and down from start to finish. It sometimes looks normal with a little guy hanging out the end called the satellite potential, okay? Um, in a normal muscle, you can have like one out of five or one out of 10 being polyphasic. So if you have more than that, that's abnormal. Also, you kind of look at them and if they're like really polyphasic, 15 turns, you go, that's not okay. That, that's really something versus just barely polyphasic, right? So we put numbers on them and we say it's normal or a lot of polys or something like that. Um, when I'm being really fancy, uh, I say, um, I saw 10 mode units, six were polyphasic, normal amp, or the usual, uh, the number of turns were like eight to 12 and the duration was 15 to 20. You know, I, I might say something like that. Shorthand in clinical practice, I just say polyphasics. Yeah. Remember small polyphasics, I'd say like less than 500 microvolts, maybe less than 300 microvolts. Um, they're skinnier, less than five milliseconds wide. I couldn't find a really good video that would demonstrate that to you. And I haven't seen a myopathy patient for a while. Um, it, so there's a video that is like eight minutes long with this guy compares and contrasts the two. And that's worth listening to. And he has some good theoretical junk too. Okay, I think the next slide. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go back to my other slideshow, uh, which was my Google Chrome. There we go, come on now. Um, bring your short ones up front. Yes, please. Um, Google Chrome, oh, there we go, okay. So, um, no, that's not what I wanna do. Let me try it again. New share, um, Google Chrome, show me the slideshow heck with you here, man. Uh, let's see what I can do. I think I can do this. Um, so I believe we have you seeing the, the shared form. Again, these are in linked in the slideshow itself. So if you look at this frozen picture, which I'll get moving, you can see in the middle uh, on the left, right hand side, there's a tall Modi unit and it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's got a few extra phases. And if you look at that little character to the right-hand side of it, that's probably just another motor unit firing at a different rate. But if that little character was attached to this first one, you'd say, whoa, that makes it even more polyphasic. And the duration, if you can see the dots on my screen, goes more than one set of dots over. I don't know what our, our 
uh, this must be 10 milliseconds per division. So it goes like, if you include both of these, it's, it's 10, probably 15 milliseconds. It'd be really pretty wide as well as tall. The one on the left that's kind of tall, it goes down, up, down, up, and it ends, unless this other character is part of it. And that's kind of normal. So let's take a look at these under motion. sound crisp they sound good they don't hear quack 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 okay so i can hear the sound from across the room and go that's a polyphasic mode unit these sound really crisp they sound kind of good okay you will probably be stopping your screen many times when you first learn about mode units so you can measure them and that's a good idea don't get fast by getting sloppy get fast by getting really proficient uh and and i can look at this and many of my friends can look at that and say, gosh, that second one was uh, 600 microvolts, duration about 0.8, it's got four turns, it's normal. You know, we, we can talk that way once we've gotten good. So take your time to look at and freeze and stop these modians, right? Um, is this, I believe, no. Um, ah, okay, so here's a polyphasic. And, and, and June Kamara, who's, he's one of the great leaders in the EMG and, and an old friend, uh, wrote the wrote the textbook right um if you want to buy a textbook buy Kamara's textbook he not only has a motor unit here that's polyphasic but if you're really clever what he's trying to show us experienced doctors is that some of the muscle cells are firing sometimes and then not firing because the motor end plates are so unstable so you'll see that maybe there's a different the amplitude changes or a little spike as part of the motor unit shows up and doesn't show up Really what I want you to see though is a polyphasic modian. So here we go. Lots of squiggles. And if you watch, sometimes it's a little taller than it was. That's what he's trying to teach us, but that's not the point. That's a really squiggly modian. One millivolt tall, so that is you know, 1,000 micro or 800 microvolts. It's kind of normal amplitude. He just didn't blow it up much on the screen. I have one more slide here, which, uh, which is this. Another link, and this is kind of, oh, come on now, go back there, please. Okay, this is a nice uh, link that just has some good pictures and descriptions if you want to read about it instead of just watch. So what are these things? These are positive waves. I'll blow it up a little bit. Yeah, those are positive waves. They go down first, right? That's a fib. It goes down first. It's very sharp, okay? The next one over might be a positive wave, actually. Fasciculations that we don't have a picture of. It's a modi unit. It's just like a normal modi, but it's doing its own thing. There's a complex repetitive discharge. The amplitudes are pretty consistent. The firing rate is pretty consistent and it doesn't show it here, but the really big trick is it stops and starts. I have pictures of these other ones. Uh, there, there's a polyphasic Modi unit, right? 100 micro, 400 microvolts tall and about 15 microvolts wide. It's got all kinds of squiggles in it. And um, there's another one down here. Uh, what's the point of these? Uh, uh, Never mind, that's not so useful there. Yeah, here we go. This picture here is a myopathic mode unit or a couple of them. They're only like 200 microvolts tall and they're crunchy and they got these little <laughs> BSAPs, brief, short, abundant polyphasics is the fancy thing. Back to the slideshow because we're going to get practical medicine with or without EMG now, okay? Um, those are the pictures we talked about. Let's talk about diseases of the arms and the neck. What are we gonna be looking for with an EMG or your clinical exam? Both, okay? They come hand to hand. So these are the common things you'll look for, right? And, and you wanna think as you go through this list and you wanna be competent at describing each of these things clinically, if not electrodiagnostically, okay? Well, if it's a cervical root lesion, you'll be sure about that if there's pain into the right place, right? If there's reflex changes, if the physical exam shows two different muscles from two different nerves that are weak, but are the same nerve root, okay? Um, the sensory exam and the sensory complaints are kind of fun. If you pulled your hand out like you're shooting a gun, your, your index finger and your thumb up, that's your six shooter, right? The middle finger and the next finger are your seven shooter. So the six shooter is the C6 nerve root, right? Below that is C7, your pinky is C8. The upper forearm is C, is a T, or the lower forearm is T1, and the armpit is T2. Going the other direction, you got your six shooter, which is your thumb and your index finger. 
you go up towards the arm, you get C5, way up in the shoulder above the, the, the elbow, above the shoulder to C4, right? So the, the complaint can tell you a lot too, but on the EMG especially, you're going to look for two different muscles from two different nerves, but the same nerve root. That is, and, in the, and in the lumbar region, especially the paraspinals, okay? The brachial plexus, well, the paraspinals are normal, duh. But again, you're going to be looking at, is it just one nerve or is it two different nerves that are part of the anatomy? And we're going to come back to the anatomy in a minute to, to whet your appetite, right? Um, I put a question mark on thoracic outlet syndrome. It certainly exists. But for some reason, your therapist and a bunch of bad doctors have seen a lot of cases and I've seen three, okay, maybe four. It's really rare and everybody overcalls it. You know, my definition of thoracic outlet syndrome is it was really the only nerve, but you did a crappy EMG, right? Median nerve, of course you think about carpal tunnel syndrome, but when you come from the head down, I think about the median nerve having um, uh, a, a, a pronator syndrome. Uh, there's actually a, a ligament up above in the mid a humerus, which is rarely entrapping this, but the pronator muscle can entrap all the muscles below it, okay? And you can have the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve that has no sensory distribution, but it's the tips of your couple of your fingers and the tip of your thumb and then a pronator that's in the forearm, mostly your thumb and fingers. You go, ooh, I can't bend the tip of my fingers. The ulnar nerve, most common, of course, at the elbow. There's also a little trivial ligament that can catch it up higher, which is kind of trivia. And then in the hand, you know, I had one of these riding a bicycle and squishing on my hypothenar eminence, the Guillain Canal, okay? Or um, you can pound it. Or there are other things like a ganglion cyst in the Guillain Canal that can either hit the side of the ulnar nerve to the, the hypothenar area or to the extent to the first dorsal neurosis, which is over on the thumb side, or just the sensory branches to those two fingers, right? The radial nerve is pretty uncommon. The most proximal thing is a Saturday night palsy. I actually saw somebody with this last week for some reason. But the, you know, you, the lady fell asleep with a lot of alcohol with her arm resting over the side of the bed and hit the radial nerve behind the, um, uh, on the back of the humerus and has, had a hand drop. She couldn't lift her, lift her hand up and she should get better over time. Um, one day I had two women who were kidnapped by a man and he put handcuffs on both of them. And both of them had a handcuff palsy. It's a sensory nerve problem over the superficial radial nerve of the hand. And less commonly, when somebody has tennis elbow, it's actually the radial motor branches getting involved at the elbow. And you might find something in the uh, forearm radial muscles, okay? The musculocutaneous nerve, suddenly somebody's got a weak biceps and somebody thinks they ruptured the biceps. Uh, but... Um, you find some sensory changes a little bit further down, or uh, you, you put your needle in the biceps and it's abnormal. Uh, and it's often due to big time effort and sometimes trauma. The suprascapular nerve, um, the person all of a sudden can't do the empty can test where they put their arm in front of them and they lift their hand up. Or when you've got their elbows at their side and their hands are in front of them, you push the hands in and one of them just melts away and hits their tummy. Um, that occurs, especially, for instance, in volleyball players, but in other overhead reaching sports. Um, and, and the spinal accessory nerve and others can get hit by tumors. Uh, uh, surgery to get a lymph node biopsy sometimes oops is that one as well, right? So I hate to scare you with anatomy, but you want to spend some time this month looking at the anatomy and remembering. I think I've memorized the brachial plexus and forgotten it four times in my life. This is one of those times just to get your brain working. The rhomboids come off the dorsal scapula right off the C5. It's the only nerve in the human body except the paraspinals, innervated by only one nerve root. All the other ones, I know in medical school, they said biceps C5. It's not true. It's C5 and C6, okay? Um, the long thoracic goes to the serratus anterior, right? And then you get this, you know, the Robert Taylor drinks cold beer, right? Root, trunk, division, cord, branches, right? So you've got the upper trunk, and that occurs with kids that get herbs palsy. And an inferior trunk, which is a clump keys palsy, because the upper trunk goes to the uh, to the to the, the um, musculocutaneous nerve, and it goes to the uh, the delta. To, to, sorry, the musculocutaneous nerve, and gets branches in the pectoral area. The middle trunk goes off, and the big mistake is somebody says, "Oh, this person's got a radial nerve palsy," and they forget to check the deltoid, which is axillary, and oops, it's also abnormal. That takes it away from being a Saturday night palsy, and there's actually something happening in the plexus. So if your radial nerve is abnormal on exam or an EMG, 
when you don't think I'm done, you think, well, where can I find something normal? And the next thing up the train line is the axillary nerve. You, you check the deltoid, okay? And you keep going up until you find out where that lesion is, right? Um, the, the, the medial cord um, uh, breaks down and there's the ulnar nerve, which goes straight down. And there's no motor fibers till you get down to the forearm, but there are some sensory fibers that are interesting. And then there's a branch that goes to the median nerve from the top and from the bottom, from C5-6 and from C8-1, right? So sensation of the median nerve in the hand is C6, it's your six shooter, right? Uh, but muscle strength of the median nerve in your thumb is C8 and even more T1 than C8, okay? So, so you're gonna kind of begin to remember this and get some post-traumatic stress disorder. Taking it one more level, let's remember again, this is kind of me helping you to verbally understand this, right? So C5 and six goes to the musculocutaneous nerve, goes to the biceps, but if it's abnormal, you go to the coracobrachialis or down to the, to the brachialis. Lower down, the median nerve gets some branches from up above, which are uh, sensory mostly. The pronator is uh, C6 and seven. These all are mostly C6 and seven. Uh, you got that um, uh, anterior interosseous nerve and those are all C7 and eight. Okay, and they branch off in a separate place. They can get dinged all by themselves. Then you get to the hand and the median muscles. You mostly worry about the, the thumb muscle, the abductor pollicis brevis is, is C8 and especially T1. Now you get to your ulnar nerve. Nothing happens much there till you get to around the elbow where you bang your ulnar nerve 100 times a day or you pop it across that elbow. It dislocates across the medial epicondyle, right? And the first muscle off is the flexor carpi ulnaris. And a really cool muscle I use all the time on my exam and on my EMG is a flexor digitorum profundus. So when you bend the tip of your pinky or the tip of your fourth finger, that's your FTP. When you do the tip, and, and those are C8T1, everything ulnar is C8T1, everything is, right? Um, but the uh, middle finger and the index finger are C7, 8, and they're median innervated, actually anterior interosseous nerve innervated. So with my EMG needle, I can go in there and get across that muscle, test each little finger at a time and test a whole bunch of nerves all at once, which is kind of cool. Um, down in the hand, the ulnar is, is it, it's got the, 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 the pinky, but it also goes over to the thumb to a variable number of muscles. Now we'll, when you get really good at EMG, you realize there are a bunch of anomalies, okay? The abductor pollicis brevis is almost always median. The first dorsal interosseous on the thumb side is almost always ulnar. And then I said, almost, right? Um, that radial nerve has the branches to the triceps and then the anconius and then the, the supinator and then all those wrist extensors and finger extensors, right? Uh, that's called the posterior interosseous nerve. And the sensory branch goes off to the outside of the thumb. Neat, because you got the median nerve going to the inside of the thumb, to the palm side of the thumb, the radial nerve going to the outside of the thumb. What if you had a race between those? You might find out you got a median neuropathy or carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So you can measure both on the thumb, right? Weird in the, tri in the, the radial nerve. The brachioradialis is C5-6 innervated. Go figure, right? So you're thinking radial, 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 everything's abnormal. Then you poke the brachioradialis and it's normal. And you're like, whoa, that's not, that's kind of weird, right? Or you're thinking cervical radiculopathy and you test the biceps and the deltoid not so clear, you check the brachioradialis, it lights up and the rest of the uh, radial nerve doesn't, okay? And the axillary nerve gets sensation over a little loop around the deltoid and uh, motor function to the deltoid. And then there's all the fancy nerves up further up in the brachial plexus. But if you understand these five nerves, you're gonna use them all the time on your clinical exam on every nerve problem. And the more you get to know where they stop and the, the lowest muscle down on that nerve and the highest muscle up on that nerve, the more your exam and your EMG will be really, really useful. Sensation, again, this is kind of just me talking at you to review stuff that you wanna study, okay? When you come to nerve roots, you know, what, C5 around the biceps, C6 on the six series, C7 in the middle finger, C8 over the ulnar uh, side, uh, T1 over the ulnar forearm, right? When it comes to the different um, uh, innervations from, from, from specific nerves, uh, many of these I kind of know, but honestly, I'll pick up this picture and I'll look at it when I get somebody says like, I'm numb over the lateral part of my forearm. Well, what the heck is that? Oh, it's the LAC. It's the lateral anterior cutaneous. No, I'm number, number, number higher up. 
Wow, that's the radial antibrachial cutaneous. I guess I never dealt with that before. Let's see if there's an EMG test to look for. Sure, there is. Okay. So it's okay to just keep looking back at these pictures. You'll get to know them quite well. The, the, the really important part here is the ulnar nerve shares the fourth finger with the median nerve. That's a place to test for carpal tunnel syndrome. The radial nerve shares the thumb with the median nerve, another place to test for carpal tunnel syndrome. The rest of it, you'll know, but you, you can kind of look it up, right? Okay. How do you do this clinically and dumb? Don't get creative right away. Do the basics and then stop and think. I'll see people find something abnormal and chase it down and then they forget to test something else. So do the basics. First off, you test strength, every joint, every direction, okay? Thumb bend, thumb straighten out, thumb push forward, thumb pick backwards, fingertips, finger base, finger extend, wrist flex, wrist extend. Um, you can do forearm pronation, supination, but yeah, elbow flex, elbow extend, shoulder goes forward, backwards, in and out, external rotate, internal rotate, and you're done, okay? And, and instead of thinking, just do it and then see what you found. The reflexes that are obvious are the biceps, triceps, and brachioradialis. You know, I just learned another one, which is the flexor pollicis longus reflex, which maybe when we get off picture, I'll show it to you because I'd never seen it before. And it's C8, it's kind of neat and it's not in the wrist. So it's not carpal tunnel. Um, the really important thing for an upper limb exam, always check the Achilles reflex, okay? I have people every couple of weeks who are spastic and I might find carpal tunnel syndrome on my EMG, but I'm worried about cervical myelopathy or a stroke. And, and like every couple of weeks, it's not rare. Obviously, also, if the Achilles reflex is absent in a young, healthy person, you're going, well, I could go on a long fishing trip looking for this nerve and that nerve and this nerve, but maybe I should stop and think, are all the nerves sick? <laughs> so in a, carpal, in a carpal tunnel workup, if the Achilles reflex is absent and you ask them, they go, yeah, my foot's kind of numb too. You might start your carpal tunnels workup by looking at a nerve in the foot. Because when everything's abnormal, you know, the jig's up and it, it speeds, up your, speeds up your life. Spurling sign is when you turn the head to the side, make them look up real high and then push down on their forehead. If it hurts in their neck, yeah, it's not a positive test. If it hurts below the shoulder, Hank Tong and I did that study. Uh, that's got a high correlation with an EMG being positive for a cervical radiculopathy. You all know the Tenel sign. You tap on the carpal tunnel and they say zing, zing. Here's my trick. For fun, tap on the back of their wrist first. And if they say zing, zing, then you do a psychological test instead of an EMG, okay, right? It's a psychological test to see if somebody's just panicking on you or they're faking, right? And then sure enough, I test on the radial nerve for fun. I test on the median nerve at the wrist and then I test on the ulnar nerve at the elbow, okay? Um, fail and test is where you have the person hold their hands in a prayer position with their elbows out for about 30 seconds. They start feeling numb. That's a positive test for carpal tunnel syndrome. Only after all you do that, you stop and go, did I make them hurt? And you start thinking about like, do they have de Quervain's tenosynovitis of the thumb? So you mush around the thumb tendon and they hurt, or they've got a ganglion cyst or, um, you know, whatever. You start looking more at musculoskeletal stuff. But if you do this in five minutes or less and then start thinking, you'll never miss a trick. Um, here's a trick that helps with this proximal problems for scapular winging. So this is poor, some poor woman or some poor guy uh, with two scapulas, right? And people do all kinds of maneuvers of doing push-ups against the wall and everything. And those are helpful, okay? But here's what you really do. You look at them, have them relax. And you look at the scapulas and you measure with a, with, a, with a measuring tape from C7 to the medial angle, from the midline to the medial angle, and from the inferior border to the medial angle. Look at, if the right scapula is too far down, you gotta go, well, what should be holding it up? Well, the trapezius holds it up. I bet there's a trapezius problem causing scapular winging. It's that simple. If the inferior angle is rotated really in, you go, well, what rotates it out? Uh, the lats will pull it out. Well, I bet you the winging is from the lats. And if the medial angle is too close to midline, is too far away from midline, you go, well, what would hold it in? And it's the rhomboids. And so it's rhomboids, right? So by just measuring, uh, unless it's really subtle, you already know what it is. And even if you can't remember the name of the muscle, you go back to an anatomy book and you say, well, what would make that go back to where it should go? And that gives you the answer, right? And then you poke your EMG needles in there and don't cause the pneumothorax because that's rude uh, and you prove it. 
Here's what my EMG looks like for an upper limb uh, exam. Now, EMG is really creative, lots of thought. I am not bored. But the way to start that I start and the way that you want to start learning is to do the basics that are pretty smart. And this is my workup for the upper limb. If you take a look at the logic, first of all, every time I say a muscle to you, I hope I say deltoid axillary C5-6. I, and if, if I don't, you should. Whenever you name the muscle, you want to go biceps, muscular chain is C5-6. You keep talking it that way, that's the name of the muscle. So I'm obviously testing the main nerves, the muscular cutaneous, axillary, median, radial, and ulnar. Um, I'm testing two different median nerves, one below the wrist, which is carpal tunnel, and one below the uh, pronator, so I could get pronator syndromes, right? But then I've got overlap because biceps and deltoid both cover C5 and 6. Uh, C6 is covered by the flexor carpi radialis 2. C7 is the FCR and the extensor indices. C8 is covered by three different muscles. C T1 is covered by two different muscles. So I've got two different muscles right away that tell me, gosh, this isn't just the median nerve. The ulnar nerve is also abnormal, right? Um, and the paraspinals in the neck are a little bit more sketchy than the low back. The low back, the most important test is the paraspinals in the neck. We haven't finished the science on that yet. This is my basic workup. It's what you want to do until you, until you start thinking a lot. Once you find something abnormal, you look at it and go, does that meet all the criteria for what I'm looking for, right? Next steps commonly for radiculopathy, you may have to find a different muscle like that brachioradialis for another C5-6 muscle or the supraspinatus. For radiculopathy, these brachioradialis, the infraspinatus, the rhomboids. Rhomboids is kind of cool because all those muscles we're talking about are C5 and C6. The rhomboids, if it's abnormal, is only C5. If it's normal, then the problem you found in the other muscles is probably only C6. So you can kind of help localize. Not perfect, but it's a good idea. Uh, the flexor pollicis longus is kind of neat because people miss the anterior interosseous all the time. Also, all these C7, 8 median muscle or radial muscles, um, they're all the same nerve too, right? So you want to find a different nerve and the anterior neurosis is the, the median nerve. Uh, when you're thinking of a radial neuropathy, look at the brachioradialis, uh, look at the triceps and go all the way up to the deltoid. Um, and when you think about an ulnar neuropathy, I usually test the, just the uh, first dorsal neuroseus, but you can have a funny pinch in the hand that hits one or the other. And also it's not a perfect, the ulnar nerve is not so well tested with EMG. So you want to do a lot of testing. So I'd go get the hypothenar mass and, and, and see, and then that flexor digitorum profundus, which I talked about before. So here's the setup for the median and the ulnar nerve. Your black active for the median goes over the middle of the thumb, okay? Uh, over, the, over the thumb muscle, maybe a little proximal instead of middle. The red reference goes someplace over a bone. I usually put it someplace over the knuckle here. And the ground is in the middle someplace, just out of the way. Classically, the ground is between your stimulator and the electrode, but in the hand, you can just put it on the back of the palm. It works. The median nerve is stimulated eight centimeters from your black electrode, but you measure the X eight centimeters by going from the electrode at an angle down to the proximal wrist crease and then down. That's just the standard. Otherwise, you got to make your own norms. The ulnar nerve, middle of the hypothenar mass and uh, one over your pinky knuckle and uh, you stimulate at the wrist at eight centimeters. So they have a race between the ulnar nerve at eight centimeters and the median nerve at eight centimeters and they ought to be pretty close. Hmm, how close? How far different do they have to be before it's really consistent with carpal tunnel syndrome, right? I'm asking about norms. I'm not answering the question until later. Now you'll end up stimulating the ulnar nerve below the elbow uh, and above the elbow. So you can check for conduction velocity across the elbow. And you'll check the median nerve at the proximal forearm to check conduction across there because if it's slow every place, yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, don't ask me why, and I can tell you, but it's a secret. With carpal tunnel syndrome, which is at the wrist, you can actually get median slowing up above the wrist for reasons that are kind of weird and geeky. Uh, don't let that put you off. Here's my favorite and most the, the most sensitive single test for carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, temperature affects nerves. And so you want to measure the same finger because it's always the same temperature, right? So you got your ring electrodes four centimeters apart on the, on the fourth finger, and you measure down to the wrist 14 centimeters. I actually do 12, pardon me, but, but the, the standards that you'll read are 14. Down to the wrist of the median nerve, 14 centimeters. 
you shock here, you shock here, you're picking up over the same place. You don't even have to move the electrodes. And you look at the difference. Wow, what if that difference is 0.2 milliseconds? What if it's 0.4? You're gonna get used to norms, okay? Here's a slide that you'll want to copy or print or write out because these are the really basic, simple things. First of all, this is what my EMG report looks like, except for when it comes down to data, I put in the norms, okay? So my basic EMG report, I've given you all my Excel spreadsheet that has this, by the way, right? What's the skin temperature is first, because if it's below 32 degrees centigrade, you gotta warm it up. If you don't have a thermometer on your EMG machine, warm up any hand that feels kind of cold. And if it feels cold and you can't warm it up, you make a note that says the hand was cold because a cold hand slows conduction velocity two meters per second below 32, if you wanna know. And it increases the amplitude. So a really abnormally low median sensory response looks normal because you let it stay cold, right? So the sensory responses, um, amplitudes of greater than 10 or 11, latencies, uh, the median is always a little slower than the ulnar, okay? Velocities in the arm are always greater than 50 meters per second, okay? For, our, for motor and sensor, if it's lower than 50 meters per second, it gets a speeding ticket, there's something wrong, okay? Um, we'll come back to, to difference between median and ulnar uh, in a bit, but more than 0.4 is the right answer here. That would be bad, that's abnormal. Motor responses, we don't have a distal conduction velocity because even though we measure 80 millimeters, the stimulation at the wrist causes the nerve to travel at 50 meters per second. And then the um, acetylcholine takes time to swim across the neuromuscular junction. And then the muscle takes time to depolarize. So it's not a true velocity. There's too many things going on there, okay? So um, you shouldn't have more than a 10% drop in the median nerve from the wrist to the elbow. If you do, something funky is going on. And that's pretty rare. On the other hand, in the ulnar nerve, there are different norms, okay? If you have a 30% drop across the elbow, that's significant. That's pretty highly correlated with an ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. Now, the other way you can look for an ulnar neuropathy at the elbow is by looking at a drop off in amplitude. Hey, if you stimulate at the wrist and you get 100 muscle cells, and you stimulate below the elbow and you get 100 muscle cells, and then you stimulate above the muscle ulnar nerve and you only get like 10 muscle cells, that's bad. Okay, that's one, is the amplitude drop. The other though is, if you stimulate the wrist and it travels fast, and you stimulate the, below the elbow and it travels at 50 meters per second, normal fast, you stimulate above the elbow and it travels 30 meters per second, that's bad. So an amplitude drop of 30% or a conduction velocity drop of more than 10 meters per second is a speeding ticket for the ulnar nerve. I typically do a second study to the first dorsal neurosis, Never mind. This is a good basic workup. If you do it, nobody's going to say it's a bad EMG, right? So if you do this, it's good. Then you get really, really creative. So what's not normal? Let's go back to that. A velocity less than 50 meters per second in the arm or 40 meters per second in the leg. You don't measure distal motor velocity because of those other things going on. Those norms are what are listed. And I've got a reference for you with more norms. For carpal tunnel syndrome, Rather than looking at whether the median motor is slow, it's much more accurate to look at its comparison to the neighbor called the ulnar nerve. Now, if they both got a big neuropathy, that's a problem, but that's pretty uncommon. If, it's, if the motor study is more than 1.4 milliseconds slower than the ulnar, that's carpal tunnel syndrome. If the sensory is more than 0.4 milliseconds slower than the ulnar, that's carpal tunnel syndrome. And the ulnar nerve, we talked about that, amplitude of more than 30, conduction more than 10. So here's another sophistication here, and it goes back to your statistics class, right? When uh, an article that I'll cite at the bottom, which is Mike Andery and Dr. Chen and others, that's a reference that you can actually pick up and print off and keep in your lab. It's got the review of all the references for the most common studies. It's a really neat article to keep, okay? Um, when they list normals, they list, you know, 97.5% 90, confidence interval, which means that what? If you do 100 EMGs, two, two and a half of them are going to be abnormal, even though the person doesn't have disease, okay? What if you tested like the carpal tunnel eight or you know, 10 different ways? Well, that's 10 times 2.5% chance of one of them being abnormal, right? And you do a Bonferroni correction if you're a statistician. But in EMG, you do just enough tests and not too many, okay? You keep on testing and testing, you're going to find something, right? And the other thing we know is that... Um, 
for a long, long time, and many of the our old studies look at means and standard deviations as if this is a normal bell-shaped curve. And it's not, because some people are super fast or very small number, and other people are kind of slow. So it's not a bell-shaped curve. When you see somebody say plus or minus two standard deviations on, on a, a reference book, yeah, it's not probably right. You're really looking for quartiles and tenth aisles or whatever 97.5% is, right? If you don't warm up the hand, I don't want to look at your report, um, right? Accurate measurements is important. We talked about that median going from the midline and then down and the ulnar goes when you're going across the elbow, you follow the medial or the ulnar nerve around the medial epicondyle with the elbow bent some to take the slack out of it. And with their hands, you want them to hold their hand real flat like a salute, right? So again, uh, I, I, I don't know Dr. Chen so well. Mike Andre and others are good buddies of mine. And they did this wonderful review that you can get on that reference that is all the norms for all the tests that you're going to normally do till you become more expert. Um, for carpal tunnel, this is what we do that's more expert, okay? Which is if it's borderline, Larry Robinson, who was trained with me, um, figured out that if you do the median and ulnar to the fourth digit and add the difference to the median and radial to the thumb and add that to something where you stimulate the median nerve in the palm and the ulnar nerve in the palm and pick it up over the wrist, which is backwards, right? Add them all together. If it's more than 1.1 milliseconds, that is the, the most sensitive, the most specific test for carpal tunnel syndrome. EMG is not perfect for ulnar neuropathy. It's not perfect for anything, but it's got some real weaknesses. It misses things. So if it, you're really suspicious and you do the normal test, then you'd put the electrodes on the first dorsal neurosis and test again. Um, you know, um, When you're looking at plexus lesions, which is probably not what we'll get into today very much, um, you're looking at the medial antebrachial cutaneous sensory nerve and the lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerve. Trauma and plexus is a really big, useful thing for EMG, and I don't want to touch on it now. I may touch on it later on, uh, but, but we had a whole trauma, a whole brachial plexus clinic every Wednesday, and all I'd see was brachial plexus injuries uh, that had been followed by the surgeons to figure out if they amputate the arm, right? Um, th there are nerve conduction studies of all the other motor nerves, like the musculocutaneous nerve and the radial nerve, et cetera, et cetera, and they have a place, but I wouldn't worry about them. They're not so useful. These F waves where we shock the muscle of the nerve and get an echo off the spinal cord, you can get them any place, uh, but you're never gonna find an abnormal F wave unless some other test is abnormal first. The only exception might be brachial plexus lesions. Did I say never mind? At least for now, never mind, right? So we got a couple more slides and we're done. Look back at this. You're gonna wanna look at what would an EMG look like if there was a brachial plexus lesion or a median nerve or an ulnar nerve or a radial nerve. And over the next weeks, I'm going to throw you EMG reports and have you kind of decide that. It's going to be based on, you know, you can look, it's an open book test. I got a book in my EMG lab, right? But you want to start going, do I understand the logic? What muscle would I test next to really be sure it's not something else, okay? So um, here at Vermont, when I was a young punk and didn't know what I was doing, I stole all of the EMGs away from Wally Bradley, who was a brilliant British neurologist and the editor of the journal Muscle and Nerve. And Wally was way smarter than me. I stole all of his business because I solved the problem of the referring doctor. I didn't just do the technical test, okay? And Wally truly was brilliant. So you do a new EMG, you're gonna do a history and a physical examination. You're gonna think and say, what do I think it is? And it includes everything from this patient's crazy to they broke their wrist. It's not just nerves, okay? but you start from the head and move down. And as rookies, you, you might even write it out. I don't think it's a stroke. I don't think it's a spinal cord injury. I don't think it's anterior horn cell disease. I don't think it's a nerve root. I don't think it's the plexus. It could be the median nerve. It could be the ulnar nerve. I don't think it's a neuromuscular junction problem. And I don't think it's a muscle disease. And I don't think they broke their wrist. You just keep doing that until you get really bored, okay? Then you do the technical data and you, in, you know, it's a, a, a table like I had. Then you interpret the data individually. Is each test normal or abnormal? Then you get a technical conclusion. Now, here's the important part. There's a difference between carpal tunnel syndrome and median amount of neuropathy at the wrist, okay? I had a lady last week who fell on both of her wrists and had a bad median amount of neuropathy at the wrist on both sides. It wasn't a compressive neuropathy. She smashed it and doing carpal tunnel release would have been stupid. So the technical results of an EMG is 
median mononeuropathy at the wrist. The clinical conclusion is carpal tunnel. Gosh, it sounds like carpal tunnel syndrome to me. It doesn't sound like she has a ganglion cyst or something like that, right? And then often enough, as a, as a treating doctor in my town, doctors are counting on me to recommend what we do next. You could try an injection of the wrist. Now, if they're an orthopedic surgeon, I give them less advice because they don't want me to tell them what to do. But the family docs just die for me to say, well, now that he's got a cervical radiculopathy, you don't have to get an MRI, blah, blah, blah. So here's my, my, one of my reports I just stole from last week's patient. Prior to testing, I'm sorry, I've got to move my picture of me so I can look at what I'm saying. At history physical exam. This sounded like carpal tunnel syndrome, but the very complex history opens the door to cervical radiculopathy, ulnar nerve, and nerve diseases associated with the basal ganglion movement disorders. This, this lady had uh, a movement disorder, but was complaining of numbness and tingling. Uh, let's see. Oh, come on now. Next step. Okay. Technical finding, the, the, the data table is someplace else. The ulnar nerve was found anterior to the medial epicondyle. That's kind of cool. When I was very careful, shocking and not over shocking, I found out that this person's ulnar nerve actually was on the wrong side of the medial epicondyle, um, right? Uh, with polyphasic motor units and some active denervation of the ulnar nerve. The median motor and sensory conduction studies were both slow with some subtle motor unit changes in the abductor pulses brevis. Proximal muscles were normal. In the context of other problems, I didn't further pursue a clinically much less likely polyneuropathy. So somebody reading this technically can get, go, I get what you meant there. Electrodiagnostic impression. Left median mononeuropathy at the wrist. I've gotten the habit of saying likely carpal tunnel that belongs down below, but I did. Left ulnar nerve is transposed with both old and recent damage, as well as slowing across the transposed nerve at the elbow. No evidence for cervical radiculopathy. Clinical impression. This really does look like carpal tunnel syndrome. It's a clinical judgment whether the continued ulnar slowing and incomplete renovation are part of the story. We discuss these issues and I'll refer back to the Dr. Durant, the great hand surgeon, okay? So that's what my report looks like. And even if you're not reporting to someone else, that's the logic of how you wanna think through an EMG. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys not only this video, but you should get a copy of the slideshow and you click on those references and take a look at those videos and the EMG norms, et cetera. I want you over time, I'll be sending you some, review some EMG reports, Look at some other ones if you've got them locally. And if at all possible, watch somebody do an EMG, okay? Get a sense of how often they're, how much they're poking and how much they're testing and stuff like that. And if at all possible, get that EMG machine from your clinic and hook yourself up and do some shocks on your wrist. If it hurts a lot, you're probably shocking too hard. Get better, okay? So playing around with the EMG machine is important. If you never become an electromographer, get good at EMG now anyhow to be good at peripheral nerve diseases and that's the end of this talk and peter is still sleeping so uh let's see how do i turn you guys off oh no stop video oh, stop recording <laughs>